Hello everybody. I hope that you are off to a great start. Look, um, for some of you this may not seem so, but for me it is definitely so. We are winding down to the close of the year. We are about to enter the final quarter of the year. And how we enter that and how we leave this year is going to be a massive influence on how the next year goes. I've been sharing it with you guys for more than 20 years uh, online, 30 years in total, uh, so many different perspectives, uh, so much of the research that I've conducted, so much of the studying and examination of facts and historical influences, uh, economic, political, socioeconomic, uh, academic, and so many other ways and offering solutions. At some point, we have to understand that knowledge in and of itself is a power. Applied knowledge is power. The ability to take what you know and solve your problems. You have not achieved knowledge if the knowledge you have has not produced the capacity to solve your problems. I would personally argue that we have the knowledge to solve our problems. We refuse to engage and invest in the application of said knowledge. We want some magic, utopian uh, event to take place for us to achieve things. Let me give you a run of where we're at as a people. Let me just run it down. We're in last place socioeconomically. Every socioeconomic barometer that is measured that has any relevance, we're in last place. Uh, the wealth gap between blacks and white, whites is widening. We're not doing better, we're doing worse. The optics give the impression that we made it, but our standing, our power, our influence, is less than it was 60 years ago. This can be measured in our ability to influence, our ability to take care of ourselves, our ability to sustain our communities, our abilities to defend ourselves from exogenous forces that move against us in our communities. We are being gentrified into oblivion and we refuse to exercise the knowledge we have to overcome it and it shows in our uh, impotency, so to speak, in our lack to avail power to accomplish the things we need to accomplish. And I have been challenging you with over 100 plus, 100,000 hours plus of research through uh, the Odyssey Project's research center. 80,000 of that is me over the last 35 years um, with that. The think tank uh, th that produced the blueprint for black empowerment, that produced uh, Black Man Lead, that produced a number of other programs that we are doing, including Music is Life, uh, the work we do with young black women uh, who have suffered from childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and so much more. Uh, the need to address mental health, we've done that. Uh, the addressing of the socioeconomic ills and how we overcome that, there's plenty of work and evidence done. The thing is, this stuff has to be implemented. On a small scale, we've done great work. On a small scale, we've, we've impacted lives. I could easily leave this world and say, man, I have helped people change their lives. I have helped people become better. I have touched my people in a way, but what I see is a people with the ability to actually impact the entire totality of the collective on a large scale. But we are so individualized that we only see where we're at, what we're doing, what we're going through. And if we're not moved by something that we can relate to directly, we don't see the totality. So if it's not something that hits close to home or someone we know, or it becomes a national event, 
we don't see the need of investing. We don't see that we're in last place and that alone should be something that moves us into action. I have been asking you guys for 20 plus years to support the work we're doing. We have continued to do the work, but the work that we're doing is limited by the resources. And the thing is, we can become very resourceful in suggesting what someone does outside of doing. You know, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Trust me. Any Here's the thing that you have to understand. And I'm getting rid of this thing. If not today, tomorrow, I'm getting rid of it. I'm tired of it. Um, let me tell you something from years and talk to the people and, and, and it's in it's in the, the proof is in the pudding you'll get millions pumped into programs that don't work but have great optics why everybody wants to give the impression that they're trying to help and by, what you got to understand is while we're sitting back and we're waiting on them to fund our empowerment the idea of that is actually ridiculous no one's going to fund your empowerment when your empowerment means their discomfort you're going to have to understand that now so anything they're pumping money to in large volumes they already know it won't work and they've done the same research i've done so they know why it won't work you can have something that looks good on the side and you can say we're doing this and you can have ribbon cuttings and you can have all these events and ward ceremonies of this person who did this and this person who did that but if you don't have proper socialization mechanisms, if you don't have proper environmental management mechanisms, if you can't address the ills and issues that are plaguing the home and flowing into the community, then all of that other stuff is just dressing, window dressing, that makes things look good, makes people feel good about themselves and allows people to still drag money out of funding sources to keep the, keep the scheme going. Anything that's going to actually produce things will have the linchpins that allow for the uh, foundational elements and component, components of success for a community, for a race, for a people to be present. And I've presented that over and over and over in my work. And I've talked to you about generational trauma. I've talked to you about the epigenetic influence on generational trauma. I've talked to you about the epigenetic influence on diseases and illnesses. I've talked to you about the epigenetic influence on childhood development, adverse childhood experiences, and how they carry out into adulthood. That a bunch of the things that we are dealing with is the result of epigenetic influences passed down generation to generation that can be interrupted, that can be mitigated, that can be changed. We have to be willing to understand what's going on. We need to be practicing group economics in a vertical spectrum. In other words, vertical group economics needs to be practiced. And what is vertical group economics? Vertical group economics isn't simply buying from other blacks. Vertical group economics is the owning and controlling of the entire economic dynamic of a particular industry in which we dominate spending. The seafood industry, the beauty supply industry, we dominate spending. I mean, the beauty supply industry is a $15 billion a year industry of which 96% is funded by black dollars. We own less than 3% of that industry and what we do own is in the retail. And that means that we are badly holding on by a thread. Why? Because if you don't control manufacturing Manufacturing and distribution, you don't control pricing. If you don't control pricing, you're probably going to be priced out of business over time. So you have to invest heavily. We will not do it. We will not go hard down in the paint and put the money together. We'll sit around and play around and talk, but we will not get behind anything that's going because we're individualized. We've been trapped. We've been trained and programmed not to trust one another. And granted, there's always somebody out there that's hustling. There's always somebody out there. But the vast majority of the people who are putting the work in get the less thing. The people who hustle run the game, they actually get more play. It amazes me how that works. The people that's running the game get millions. Black Lives Matter took us. Gave them over $100 million. They buying houses, gated communities, cars, and everything else. I mean, no major push, no major thing being done in the uh, community. All the work that's necessary. I'm doing a major workshop in Houston. Uh, a major workshop in Houston on uh, 
trauma, adverse childhood experiences, epigenetics, the distrust between people in the inner city community and law enforcement. Law enforcement will be involved. I have been working for almost a year now with uh, Wellspring Community Center and the Harris County Sheriff's Office and also, also working with uh, the University of Houston who has done a study in a specific community here in Houston. And I am going to be doing a workshop in October. And these families are gonna benefit from this workshop and they're not gonna have to spend the dime. But you know this funding has to come from somewhere. So what are we doing? What are we doing? And I'm gonna go hard in the paint. I'm, I'm not leaving anything on the deck. I'm going to uh, do everything I can with my business to make sure I'm good and my family is good, but I'm also gonna love on my people because my people need me to. The problem is there is so much more that can be done if we actually came together and worked. Again, I'm gonna be pushing for support. I'm not going to ease up on it. And I say that all the time, but I'm just a person that you ask a person and they see what you're doing, they, they either for you or you're against you. And the thing is, our people don't know how to get on code, period. They get on code, let one of their people kill one of our people, be dead damn wrong. And the prosecutors say we're prosecuting and the, black, the blacks raise up and say, we're upset, we want justice. Watch what happens. I be doggone. If they don't sit up and rape, that, that guy that choked out the kid on the train in New York, 15 minutes in a chokehold, kid wasn't armed, kid was obviously suffering from mental health issues. Another thing that I work on, and that's a whole nother thing. I can't even get into that deeply. But chokes him 15 minutes, kills him, to the point to where the DA actually feels, hey man, we gotta bring charges. What happens? They set up a GoFundMe page. This dude in 48 hours raises $2 million. That's being on code. It has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with who's right. That has everything to do with one of ours is on the line. If we can save him, we gonna save him. Uh, prime, another prime example. White kid rapes an unconscious, drunk, unconscious woman on side of a dumpster. Brock Turner, I think that's his name rapes this person multiple witnesses walk up on him catch him hold him until the police gets there gets convicted of the rape judge says that sending him to prison wouldn't be the best thing to do uh that it would ruin his career and that it would be traumatic you mean the same way it's traumatic for black men who go to jail for a whole lot less but that's called being on code and I'm not about, I'm, I'm not here. I'm one of those people that's complaining, saying, I want to get away with the stuff white people get away with. No, I want to operate by a certain standard, by a certain code. But what I do want to say is we need to be on code. We need to protect ours. We need to put in work. We need to do the things that are necessary to hold our things together. You know, I didn't just pop up yesterday. I've been consistent on this message for years. I mean, I've been consistent on this message. I've gone wherever I've been asked. I've gone to war uh, with school districts. I've gone to war with police departments. I've, 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 I mean, I've put in the work. Uh, not to mention in, mention in my field, talking about mental health. We got a 49% spike in black male suicides from, the, uh, from ages 14 to 24. We got... Uh, our young girls, ages 5 to 13, leading in suicide in a statistical category. We got spikes in depression for black women, which lead all women in, 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 in the uh, occurrence of depression, and women have depression more than men, which goes to say if we got a spike of 49% of males killing themselves, we got to really be concerned about our women. All of this stuff is happening simultaneously, and the only ones who are going to do anything about it is us. But we're not going to sit around and do it through osmosis. We're not going to do it through wishful thinking. We're not going to do it through... We're not going to do it through uh, hoping. Hoping and wishing and complaining are not strategies. Hoping and wishing and complainings are not plans. We're going to have to be willing to step in. Again, 
uh, black men lead alone will impact African-American and adolescent and young adult male violence. It will impact the incarceration rate. It will impact the viability of black males uh, who are economically sound and able to support families. This is a major move in so many different areas. And I've been talking to you about it to um, just uh, lips chat. And you, know, you get plenty of likes. You get a lot of, hey, you're doing a great job. That does not advance the cause. I appreciate you. I thank you for your words of kindness. All of your words of encouragement are necessary because this job isn't easy. This passion, this purpose isn't easy. It comes with uh, so much weight. And you don't get to see what comes across my desk every day. You don't get to see the people who are suffering. You don't get to see. And now I'm about to wage war with the uh, Texas uh, legislature about policies and statutes concerning uh, black men specifically with mental health issues and the inability to effectively get them help because of policies that will not acknowledge the fact that they need it until they've actually done something detrimental to someone else or to themselves. And so now that's on the table. And so I'm going to war with that. I'm off and running because the, the statutes have to change. I've got too many people I'm trying to get help to, but we can't get them help because they don't want help because they're actually in states where they don't realize that they're suffering with a form of psychosis. So you can't help them until they harm somebody. Now you want to put them in prison. And so we've got to have a means of doing this. I understand the whole thing about protecting people's rights, but the thing is, it's a hustle. It's too many of our men on MMHRA in prison because nobody advocated for them before they got there, before before things got too, too bad. So again, I'm going to sit up and I'm going to challenge you. Support the work we do at the Odyssey Project. Uh, give. Um, you know, I mean, give, give. We need to really truly be pushing a million a year to do the work we need to do. And because we need to bring in the people who can manage that, keep everything going. I'm, you know, one person with some people who are working with me and pretty much giving their time. You know, some people have to pay for certain things to do. Um, but a lot of people come in, you know, and do things like pe the research I, I was able to do on recidivism, uh, with uh, offenders, so a couple of people came in and assisted on that research. That was two years that people came and gave their time. But other services, you know, whether it's an investigator, whether it's uh, housing, whatever, when someone comes and say, "Hey, look, my rent's about to get, uh, I'm about to get evicted because I can't pay my rent," you know, they don't they don't take, "Hey, uh, we praying for." Uh, as a means of covering that. They want their money and they want it. They don't want promises or nothing. They want their money. And the thing is, we've got to have that. And we've got to have ways of training people and reskilling them to be able to produce the type of income that allows them to uh, sustain a lifestyle. Uh, that's the other thing. We need to totally reinvest in, well, invest because we haven't invested in developing a higher skill level or high level of training and not necessarily in degreed areas because that's trusting that your degree is going to get you a job so we need to give skill sets and there's we need more electricians we need more mechanics we need more plumbers uh we need we need more uh carpenters and roofers we need uh to well, it may be way too late to puncture the uh, landscaping business, but I mean, it's so much freaking money in landscaping. You would know it until you get ready to pay somebody to do it on a grand scale. And you're like, what the hell? I got into the wrong damn business. And maybe my grandfather was on something because when he retired, that's what he did. He's op he opened up a landscaping business. And that's what he did until he was unable to. But all that to say, hey, I need your support. The people at the Odyssey uh, project needs to support, but more importantly, the black community needs to come together. And I need more voices. I need more minds. I need people to come in and do this with me as well. 
Uh, and I'm not, I, I'm not a grandstander. It's not about putting my name on something and saying, look at what I'm doing. It's about getting it done. And so that is my thing. So once again, I'm challenging you. Hey, let's, let's make it happen. Come in. Uh, the links to give are in the description box. Don't leave this without giving. Click the like button. Click the share button. Subscribe. But give. That's the challenge. What we do as a people for our people is going to determine the outcome of the collective in the next 10, 15 years. And we are really sitting at a very pivotal moment. If you don't understand, just pay attention to what I've shared with you over the last, just say 10 years. You can go back further, but the last 10 years, and then come and look at what I uh, am gonna share with you through the closing of this year. And you judge for yourself, but we've got work to do and we can't sit around and wait for someone else to do it for us. So on that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder.